various kinds of printer technology. This one's called um, filament deposition modeling, which is a, a fairly technical term for what is basically squeezing plastic out. There's another technology called laser sintering or selective laser sintering where you put down a powder of plastic or metal and I use a laser to melt it. And the selective part of the name means you melt it in certain specific points and then you put another layer of powder and then melt another uh, set of points. And then you gradually build up the model in layers. This melts plastic. So it's almost like a spider weaving a web around and then it goes up and does another layer, another layer, another layer. So this is an example of um, someone's designed some headphones. You can normally tell this kind, this kind of print is being used because you'll see, you can see the layers in the, in the object. Okay. Uh, I'll pass some objects on that. Pass the cat around. So if you look at that, one thing you can see is, is the layers are quite distinct. Uh, so that's the way you can always tell that it's been printed on a machine like this. Um, so that's the set heaven standard design uh, is open source. So you can download that, you can print your own, or you can even modify it yourself. You can print it in different colours, you can print it white, paint it, whatever you like. That's what open source means. Um, so another selection of uh, objects. This basically shows a range. So some people have gone for models, but others have gone for machines. Okay, there's parts, parts of the machine. Um, a group in PAE systems uh, printed a bike. So they took it off the printer, put the tires on, and probably the chain as well. I don't know if that's printed, hard to tell. Uh, and then they rode, rode it out of the, the lab. <laughs> so one of the, another distinction of this kind of printer is what comes off of the bed, you can use immediately. So that's come off the bed. You, you throw it around, it doesn't break, you can use the machine. Uh, other kinds of printer, like one I mentioned earlier, like selective laser sintering, you do that and it just breaks, it shatters. Um, keychains. This is, that's the original, and someone scanned that object with a 3D scanner, and then they duplicated it on a 3D printer. Right. So you can imagine if you're on the space station and you've got a problem with some, some of the, the systems, someone down on Earth could do the design or scan the object that you need to make the repair with and then you print it on the space station. So you don't have to ship up a lot of spares to, uh, to the, the ISS. You literally just keep a stock of plastic, this sort of stuff, and what is sent to the designs. Okay, now they're just doing some experiments now to put a printer that works similar to this up on the space station. They, there's a an aircraft they use over in the US called the Vomit Comet, where you, it simulates uh, uh, null gravity. Um, and they've flown the printer on there prior to then flying it on the, the space station. So one of these will be up in space soon. The Americans um, have 3D printers on their aircraft carriers. Um, a lot of the components in some of the fighter aircraft are plastic. So now they, 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 instead of shipping out spare parts, they send the design over and they print it out on the ship so they don't have to wait a week or so um, for the spares to arrive before they can make the aircraft operation again. So it's used in quite a lot of places and some that you wouldn't expect. Um, one of the early uses, so the use of 3D printing goes back about 30 years. It was first used a lot in um, jewellery and in dentistry. Uh, and this is an example of it being used in fashion. So someone's built a prototype of a, of a watch from a 3D printer. It's quicker to do that than it is to try and fashion the material out of metal. And it's cheaper to do it this way than it is to fashion a model out of wax and then use lost wax to, to cast a metal version. So the, the artist or whoever's designed this can have a look at what they've done and they can decide if they want to change it or not. And the advantage of doing it in plastic, this stuff, is that if you don't like what you've done, you can recycle it. 
So you could melt it back into a form like that and put it through the printer again. So there's very little waste. Uh, oh yes, mummies. Mummies, when they're in a, uh, sarcophaguses, uh, normally they're wrapped in bandages or they certainly have a wrapping. And uh, the problem is that they want to find out information about the, um, the body within the wrapping. You have to take the wrapping off and it can be quite destructive. What they did here is they did a CAT scan of the mummy in the wrapping so they could identify what the shape was underneath and then they freely printed the shape. I'm not so sure how they got to the colouring. I think that's probably artistic license. Uh, and then recently they did a CAT scan of a rabbit that was alive um, and they got basically the, the 3D model of the bone structure and then they printed out the skeleton so, without touching, without obviously no animals were hurt. <laughs> Um, this is part of a laser um, bed, so if you're doing optics experiments with lasers, you, you want to be able to adjust mirrors and stuff. So this basically is 3D printed with a standard mirror, uh, mirror mounting, and so you can adjust the, uh, the mirror. The thing about point about this is that um, scientific equipment is very expensive. Um, this makes it much cheaper. And if you want to create your own experiments or your own equipment, then it's much easier to do with one of these things. Um, right, the other thing about 3D printing is you can personalize things. So if you look at the way plastic objects are made in industry, normally it's by injection molding, which means you spend a lot of money on a, on a mold, a metal mold, and you scrap plastic into it. Uh, and, when, and then you cool the mold, take the plastic out, and do another one. So the metal part is very expensive, um, but it becomes cheap because you produce hundreds of thousands of objects. Well, if you have to replace someone's leg, uh, it's very likely, it's, very, it's going to be unique to them, certainly uh, some of the measurements. And so this is where 3D printing becomes very applicable, because it's quite cheap to produce that one off. Certainly cheaper than if you use the normal 3, uh, injection molding process. This is the, so going back 20 years or so, this is what 3D printing started out being used for, to build prototypes. So before they did the final design uh, on, a, on a product, they would prototype it using materials that allowed them to get a feel of uh, what the product weighed, what it would look like, how it would handle. So they would, they would use uh, 3D printing for prototyping. What's happened is 3D printing is moving into an area where it's being used for products. So a large number of Chinese factories now have 3D printers in that are working alongside traditional machines. Uh, you can build a printer house. Oh well, depends how big you, you make the printer. Record. This is a mock-up, but there is a guy in uh, London called uh, Enrico Dini who um, has developed a system called um, D-Shape. Which is, used, which is specifically designed to print buildings. I'll have a look at some of that later. Someone's designed a ratchet system. You can design, you can design different ways of solving problems than products exist to solve today. Because there are, there are ways you can exploit the cost and the technology. You can't, for example, in metal. So it can be easier to make things in one way with plastic than it can be with the metal. So this person was trying to figure out, well, how do I make a ratchet spanner? So the problem he was solving was, how do I make a workable ratchet? Okay, Plastic has a different set of properties to metal. Okay, Metal can be very hard, but it can be brittle, whereas plastic is less hard, but it can be more elastic. And so those properties allow you to approach solving problems in a slightly different way. Um, you can use it printing to... Um, in curating in museums. So rather than have the original statues or artwork um, behind glasses that people can't touch, you can print models using the same idea of 3D scanning printing. And now people can handle like, the model, they can touch it. It gives you another uh, dimension of uh, exploring the artwork. Um, that's an engine that's completely printed. So there's a, not this type of printer, but the powder printers, you can print moving parts. So you basically you, you have powder that you center, and you get to the top, and you finish, you brush all the unsintered 
powder away, and then you put air blast through, and it frees up the moving parts, and then they move. <laughs> That's one of the traditional ones where you use. So this is printed, but it's printed in wax. So you don't only have to print plastic; you can print wax, uh, and then you use lost wax method to then make a metal version. Do you do any of this kind of? Okay. We don't do lots of wax casting. They will need to know a little bit about it for the exam. So, right. yeah. Okay. So this is wax. It's specifically formulated to be able to do lost wax. Okay, lost wax casting. So the idea is, you make this model in wax. You put it into um, a powder bed. Um, and then you pour in molten metal, and the molten metal replaces the, the wax, takes the form that the wax did, but the wax has burnt away. And you can do the same with this plastic. Plastic melts at about 170, 75 degrees, so it's perfectly possible to use it for lost, uh, lost casting. Uh, you get other types of plastic that can resist higher temperatures. Uh, can you imagine someone doing this by hand or even a machine doing it? Very difficult. There are some things that you can do with printing you can't do any other way. Uh, it's another example of um, you have to look twice to realize that this person has a prosthetic leg. Now uh, you can do that because it's cheap enough to do it for that individual using that kind of technology. Before, they would do it out of metal, and all you would have would be a rod. So it would be quite obvious that you have a percent of that. Uh, don't buy Lego. <laughs> Make it. Print your own Lego. In fact, there's Lego. Uh, some, some robots. A lot of these are open design. You can download the designs and print them off, even though, for example. Uh, this, uh, this duck had a problem with one of its feet, so they printed a prosthetic foot. So that is, in effect, a mirror of its, of its the sound foot. And so now the duck can waddle around. Uh, okay, chain. Used it for car, to prototyping car designs. That's about, um, so what's that, 10 feet? About 10 feet long, so it's near full, full size. That's all printed. Uh, that's an engine case, and that again is one of the, the lost wax type of approaches. So they modelled it in plastic as a prototype, and when they're happy with the dimensions, then they um, use it to form a mould to then produce a metal version. This is a winch. So this is an example of quite a complicated machine that's been printed. All of this is printed, and this can lift about 30 kilograms which is probably just a little bit less than any of you weigh. Um, that's been printed. Again, you don't have to just print plastic. So this plastic is called PLA, which is polylactic acid. It's derived from plant material, so it doesn't rely on oil. Um, so the Lego pieces you see there come from plant material. The Lego pieces you buy are made out of ABS, a plastic called ABS, which does come from oil. Um, but you can print very f using flex, very flexible uh, material, a uh, form of nylon. Again, that comes from oil. And you can colour it as you print it as well. Uh, clock. That's, sorry, that's a kit. So you can download the kit and you can design your own clock. And print it out. Um, what's that from? Anybody play Portal? <laughs> so you'll recognise that. <laughs> it's a life cube? It's no companion cube. Uh, <laughs> so one of the, the, the crazies that occurred a couple of years ago was people discovered you could do um, you could extract three-dimensional models from games and you could print it in paper and you spend weeks gluing the bits of paper together and you end up with a model of something from a game. Well, you can use the same three-dimensional model that you extracted from the game with 3D printing. So now you don't have to spend weeks cutting out paper and gluing it together. You just print it. <laughs> there, there are businesses that make a lot of money out of generating objects from games. 
Uh, another go at the house. Right. So this is the third time you've seen the house. So can you guess what kind of material is being extruded here? It's not going to be plastic or metal. Okay. It's ceramic. Okay. So ceramic is very a very hard material. You can use it in building once it's fired, right? Or you've processed it in some way. Uh, but you can't print it in that form. So you print it as clay and then you process it afterwards in place to get the hardened form. Uh, and this is something that this guy, Enrico Dini, has developed. Parachutes. Now, there's um, a story that the guy, uh, one of the guys who worked on these early on, he printed some beach sandals for his daughter. And then she outgrew them. So he took the old sandals, he ground it up, generated more filament, and printed her another pair that was slightly bigger. So now you don't have to go to the shoe shop. Right, Mr. Dini, he's a hero. Okay, this is a building he's printed. Right? What he's printed it in is, I think it's, he won't let on because it's a secret, but basically he uses, uh, it must be an uh, aluminium sulfate, of which we have an abundance on this planet. And then he, I think he uses magnesium sulfate as an activator, and what, he do, what he's done is develop uh, uh, mock rock. It's synthetic rock, this stuff hardens and it's like rock. Um, most of what he's done is a, it's like a demonstration, he's built sculptures, but they're very organic and they're in shapes you would never conceive of being able to build, like a normal builder would be able to do. So that's one of his um, shapes. Okay, and that's part of the process. So you see this, this is um, the workhead is going past a layer of powder, and what it's doing is it's basically squirting down something that will bind the powder turn it from a powder to a solid. And that's probably the aluminum sulfate. And then what happens when it gets to the end, um, it puts down another layer of powder and it repeats the process of squirting on the binder. And so it goes on and on and on. And that's another view of the same machine. This is a very large machine. It's probably the size of this ring. Okay, so this, the point about this technique is it scales up. It's very, a very, fairly simple machine. You get big ones. So there it is finished, and he's been removing the powder. Okay, so that's kind of what it would look like. So that's a powder-based printing. That's not what this does. Yeah. Uh, another design you can download. This is for earbuds for your Wi-Fi. Just to keep them tidy. So someone's taken this idea, <laughs> and they've decided to use it to draw pictures on eggs. <laughs> so this is, this is called the egg box, and you can download it, and basically it uses stepper motors like this does, and you can use the same control electronics to build one of those if you really want to print on eggs. Can't the phone. Right, one of the things you can do with 3D printing you can't do with normal machines, is you can produce an object that's solid, and it can have uh, a curved pathway through it. Okay? That's is very important with high-performance engines, because what is important is to cool the engine. And the problem is that if you use normal drills, you drill holes which meet in angles, and that slows down the flow of coolant, and therefore it makes the engine a bit less efficient. With 3D printing, you form the voids and the tubes as you go, and so you can make them curved, you can make them any shape. And so you can make quite efficient engines. And you put that together with um, some uh, companies have been producing ceramic engines and you see how 3D printing then applies. You use the 3D printer to lay down the, um, is it green ceramic? I don't know what the terminology is. In a shape like this and then you put it in the, the kiln and fire it and you have an engine. But it's a very efficient engine. This is part of the printer, it's this part here. That's called the extruder. There, and that's the key part of the extruder. And this is a printer like this printing an extruder for another printer like this. So one of the uh, drivers for this whole exercise, it was started by a chap by the name of Adrian Boyer over at Bath University, because he wanted people to be able to make printers and then share the printing. So one person builds a printer, they can build printers for 10 other people. And this is 
that activity in program. Uh, this is a pump, a peristaltic pump. So you can pump material that is quite fragile, so you can't use normal pumps that are damaged, for example, blood. That's another kind of motor. It's used in robotics. It's called a harmonic drive. This, yeah, so this is printed from a CAT scan. And it was printed um, so that they could replace the jaw because this lady had a cancer. And they knew that they would have to remove the jaw. So they, were gonna, they needed to figure out how do we replace the jaw before they did. Um, we'll come back to it. Um, but but for late, later on, you'll see what they actually uh, produced. Um, this is something I did. So this is like a normal strap clasp. And that's a whistle. And in the modeling software, the OpenSCAD, you can combine these. These are examples of solid geometry. And the, one of the applications you'll look at allows you to manipulate solid geometry. And you can combine them and then print it. And so you're a class that whistle, whistles. It's like one of these. And the problem with this is that that's a good size for an adult. Just, it's a bit bulky. It's far too big for a child, but you can't buy these smaller. So the idea is if you can model it, then you can scale it down and print uh, a smaller version. Uh, no. You can't go too small because um, the whistle won't work if you make it too small. Uh, using chemistry to print models, robots. So they look friendly now. Uh, again, shoes, only this, what they, this person did, I, I did a hybrid of the whistle and the cloud. They've done a hybrid of uh, the, I, uh, the iPad, no, no, that's an iPad, isn't it? And a shoe. <laughs> I'm quite sure. Uh, <laughs> right, Mr. Zinni again. So this is again views of the machine progress, but you can get an idea of the scale of the thing. Right, so how could you use this? Well, if there's a catastrophe somewhere, you wheel a machine out that can take sand from the local area and it produce buildings. So you don't have to ship buildings to sites that have had earthquakes or floods. Um, Someone's built a, this is an analog computer. So this is part of an analog computer like Babbage's Difference Engine. Someone's designed one and they're printing it. Again, so you can download those designs. This is a medical bracelet. So you can print something that's customized for the individual. So she likes pink and white. I mean, you could print it in another color, depending on someone's preference. Uh, that's another machine. Right, maybe your jaw has to be replaced. What they did was having got a scan of the jaw, they could then take the model of that jaw and then they could produce a sintered metal version. This is titanium, this is the same metal that's used in uh, aircraft. And one of the properties of titanium is your body doesn't react too much to titanium. Um, so they could print the jaw bone ahead of time before they had to replace it and then the operation would proceed much more quickly. And it was a perfect match as well. Because it was exactly the same shape, size, as uh, her original jaw. Um, anybody seen Pixar films? Yeah, this is right, Luxo Junior. Again, it's something you can download and print off. Um, probably a bit young for Da Vinci Code. Anyway, in Da Vinci Code, there's a thing called the Codex. So this is some kind of model of the codex, which is basically like a little portable safe. You have to figure out a combination that uh, breaks apart and you can get it while others inside. Um, MIT, who's quite a famous uh, university college in the US, um, they're figuring out how to print food. So this is a series of papers about printing food, mostly burgers, I think. That's the way it's uh, modular bird, bird box, uh, more optics, so someone's basically developed an open source optics lab. Um, the cost is, I mean the cost difference between that and buying 
material from a traditional supplier is uh, quite significant. Right, Mr. Deeney again. This is setting up a printer to print a house. Okay, so this shows you the kind of size you can get printers. Right, so here's the thing. The guy who developed this uh, was Adrian Boyer at Bath University, and he could do it because the patents on the process had lapsed. Okay, so patents last 20, 20, 25 years. But the original idea behind all of that was, um, it came from a guy by the name of John von Neumann, who's the father of computing. But it was, computing wasn't the principal concern he had. It was tied up with what a lot of other people were thinking, is that if you go to the moon or another planet, what do you take with you? <laughs> it's, it's no good phoning John Lewis and asking to ship a replacement chair or something. You have to take something that allows you to build things. And so the answer basically was, you have a device like this that can construct anything, and you have a computer that you can use to control anything. So a lot of what John von Neumann is associated with is computers, but actually he also cooked up a lot of the ideas behind what's called the universal constructor. Otherwise known as the Santa Claus machine, because you could make anything you needed. So we take what Mr. Deeney's doing, and we translate it to the moon, and then this, so this is what the machines are about. So the, the idea is all of this has been printed by robots, and it can use them, the moon does. So I mean himself, it's basically rock. That's a cutaway. So they would have printed this bit, and then they print this, which I guess is basically a shield against meteor strike. Right, and then that's an example of something that's been printed here using the process that they would duplicate on the moon. So now all you have to do is send the robot. You don't have to send all the building material and all the life support systems for the, um, the astronauts. A lot of it you can make there. But you'd probably send a couple of machines this size first. So the first thing that they would do is build other machines that are a bit bigger until you get to the size that they could then start printing houses and so on. Um, so this is a machine that someone's designed and printed that does star tracking with a camera. Um, parts of a rocket. It's a real rocket. And the yellow bits down here, or those, those are printed. Um, and that's something they're thinking about printing on the space station when they get a printer that can, that's capable. This is a robot that works in our space. And it's an example of where you design something very differently. Right, because of the environment you're in, but also the kind of capability you have with the machine. You wouldn't design something like this to work on the Earth, because there's no support. It has, you know, it has to have something to support itself to then to be able to manipulate things, whereas in space it doesn't need to hold on to the ground. And there's the rocket again, but this time they're doing a, a, a full burn test. Um, if you're interested in the art side of this, the guy to look for is... Yeah, is enough. He's done a lot of uh, work, but most of what he does is he uses mathematics to define shapes, and then he uses that. Those, then he prints the shapes. Some of them are very odd. Uh, that's an open source remote control car. If anybody who's into remote control, yeah. that's an open source ROV, remote operating vehicle. So the idea is this goes underwater. Uh, there's an X Prize that's been announced to come up with uh, pH testers to work in the oceans, to be able to sample the oceans to find out how acidic they are. And there are two prizes, one for being very accurate and one for being very cheap. Well, one of the things you have to do is get the, the sampling systems down to a point to do the sampling, and that's where these things come out. Well, this is an open source design, anybody can print it. Uh, that's something you can't produce other than by printing. Okay, it's not very usable, but it's an example. Uh, you couldn't produce that by machine. Uh, ah, yes. Someone's printed an ear. So what they've done, the ear is a lot of, it doesn't turn, it's mostly collagen. 
Um, so what they do is that they print the collagen and then they seed it with material from stem cells, so it won't be rejected by the person's body. Uh, and that then create and the collagen forms the scaffolding and the, the cells um, multiply to form the flesh around it. So you end up with an ear. It's not a functional ear because you know the actual hearing apparatus won't be there. Um, so they replace it with an electronic equivalent. Mr. Dean again. You might, yeah, I guess, so. yeah, I think he's quite a good uh, Electric motor. So the idea with this is, well, we can print the bits, but what we really want to be able to do is print circuits, and we want to be able to print electronic and electrical items. So this is a design where someone's figuring out how to print motors. That's a model of a jet engine that will run at about 2,000 RPM. That's the plastic bits to a printer kit. So you've got more or less that there. Um, core copters, anybody into core copters? That's all printed, so open design again. Uh, that's the Raspberry Pi, which comes as a bare circuit, so you really want to have a case for it, you can print the case. Aesthetics again, that's um, a fully articulated hand. Right, again, the, the reason it's important is that this kind of technology lowers the cost of doing this sort of thing, doing experiments with this kind of machine, which is what that is. Okay, so you can you can do thing you could do a hundred experiments for the cost it would have taken five years ago with metal and traditional plastic. Uh, <laughs> right, someone okay. someone's launched a competition um, for someone to come up with a printable rocket engine. So you saw that NASA, earlier, the earlier pictures were from NASA. They'd done parts of rocket. The idea is this is completely printed. And bear in mind that um, a large part of rocket now is ceramic. So you've already seen that you can print ceramic. So it's not um, impossible. All right. Anybody seen Skyfall? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he had a vintage Aston Martin DB5 that they blew to bits. That one. And they did. Well, that's the picture of them blowing it to bits, but actually it was a model. And that's the model, and the model was printed. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's, and this is all printed. But you couldn't tell. I think it was three quarter life size. But it just looked exactly like the, the real thing. So they didn't really blow, blow up. <laughs> I think it's just a matter of DB5, I think, yeah. <laughs> Just the dizzing off again. But he explores shapes, right? Now, the point about this is that he's not, he may not be very good with his hands. He may not be able to form this kind of material as pottery, but he can do it in his brain, and he can do the models on the computer, and the machine prints it out for him. So he can realise quite beautiful artistic objects, but he may not be capable of physically producing them in the A robot. This is an open source. This is a hexapod. Robot spider. Um, ah. Back to motors. This is a stepper motor. One of the most important components on here are these things, which are stepper motors. Basically, you put a pulse in and it goes round a step at a time, round in a circle. And you can be very precise about how it does that. And that's important to robotics, to machines, lots of things. So people are interested in producing a printed version of that, which is what this is. So someone's developed a printed version. Haven't figured out the electronics yet. Um, so this is a fan. So that's an aero generator to generate power from wind. That's a full-size model of a turboprop. So this was in an exercise sponsored by Autodesk, who do three-dimensional design software. Um, one of the things about models and prototypes is you want to explore aspects of a product without having to build the product. Well, this allowed them to effectively build a model of the whole engine. So they could look at things, well, how easy was it to access different parts of it to do maintenance, how do you wire it up and so on. Robot. That's, That's the computer again. You can make your own tools, a pair of tweezers. If you're in space and you lose the tweezer overboard, right, it's disappeared off towards the moon, you can print another one. Uh, these are containers. 
That's a drone. That's a fully printed drone with the exception of the motor and the undercarriage. Scott the engineer. Blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Going to a technology company, you can t normally differentiate between managers and engineers. I'm an engineer. I do stuff. <laughs> Not a robot. This is a working motor. So it's the design of effectively a steam engine, but you drive it with air. This plastic wouldn't survive steam, but you can build, build the equivalent. Um, and a house. Right, so, so those are examples of the kind of things that you can do with a 3D printer. Right? You don't have to wait for Lego to bring out the kit for, I don't know, Star Wars 7 or whatever. You can sit down and if you can use the design software, you can design something yourself and print it yourself. Have you given any thoughts to the kind of things you'd want to do with printing? You were saying, making some suggestions. Yeah. What are you thinking, Kevin? Kevin, what are you thinking about? Kevin's interested in engines, aren't you? Oh, right. Okay. So, yeah. Who else? Tunnels. Oh, it's tunnels. He's really interested in his drawings. Ear tunnels. Oh, oh those so, tunneling. Yeah, oh, okay. the plugs, something. Right. So you're thinking about whether you could design different yeah. ones, which I think actually is quite a good thing because it's hard to do that any other way so, apart from turning. Yeah. But you can't come up with the same kind of shapes you could do in that. So. There's a site, so if you want ideas, right, there's a site called Thingiverse, mm -hmm. which is basically a database of thingies. Right? These, these are thingies. So in, like that, that is a thing called a structure. Right? That's printed. It's exactly the same plastic as the objects passed around, except depending on how you print it, you get different properties. So you can't bend the cap, you can bend that. It's exactly the same material. And you can do things quite dense as well. That's part of the printer. So one of the things you can do with this that you can't do with injection molding, with injection molding you spread the plastic in and where there's a space there's plastic so it's solid. With this you can decide how you fill it. It's a honeycomb centre front. So if you, if you go on Thingiverse, I mean, they've got hundreds of thousands of objects that you can look at. A lot of them are iPhone cases, but there are a lot of interesting objects as well. Okay. So the group I'm with is the Ten Valley Rep Rep Group. There are about 40 of us now have produced printers. So it's quite probably the largest group in the world, in a small area, right, that, have, that have done this. Uh, and our printer is based on an open source design called Crossing. Um, so that's basically what, that was the original printer and that's what our design is. So it, it varies in a few ways but essentially it's the same kind of thing. Um, so you start with some bits like this. Does anybody know about Meccano? Yeah. Right. yeah. It was bolts and bits of metal and yeah. So that's the Meccano bit. You also have a load of plastic. Okay, so all the white bits on there plus the blue, so that blue bit, is plastic. And that was all printed on another printer like that one. Um, and then you start. So this is an overview of what the process you go through to build a printer. So the plastic is used to set, if you like, the framework, like what the structure would look like and use the metal right, as a major part of the frame. Okay. Um, so you start by making one side of it. You make two of those and that gives you the two sides. You then connect them together and this gives you another axis. So this is the Z axis. So your two motors sit up there and they drive the Z axis which makes the dough go up and down. So that's what it then looks like. So that's the first step. And then there are lots of other bits you put together. But you can do them like in separate groups. So one group does that frame, another group does this x-axis here, another group does the bed, another group does the extruder. 
That's the x-axis. And then you finish that and then you can mate it to the machine. And then you have that part of the machine finished. That's the bed. And that's the extruder. That's the important thing. So the way it works is the extruder basically is a motor that pulls the plastic filament through and it pushes it into a hot block, hot metal block, which melts it and then it squirts out at the bottom. And what the rest of the machine does is decides where it's going to squirt it. So there's a video in it, hopefully I'll show you all the time. And that's the hot bit of metal there. So this is what's referred to as the hot end. <laughs> that's a close-up. Um, there are some design decisions you'll make. So there are instructions and guidance as to how you build this. And the reason I'm going to be here is to help you build the thing. Okay. So you learn from my mistakes. But you have to make some decisions as well. Um, so for example, in the, the default design, the hot end connects all the way through to the electronics. Well, you have to decide where you're going to put the electronics. I decided to do it one way. But there are other ways you can do it. And I also decided that I didn't want to wire it all the way back to electronics. So I put a plug and socket on it, which makes it easy for me to take it apart if I need to. Okay, that's the extruder. So there's the hot end, and it's mated to the extruder part. That's the motor that pulls the plastic through. You use quite a few bearings in this machine. They're from skates, skate bearings. Uh, so that's a view of the machine before it's wired up. Okay, so it's a bit simpler view than that one. So extruder, those two, those two motors make the bed go up and down, so that's the z-axis. The extruder moves left and right on the x-axis, and the bed moves in and out, which is the y-axis. So the x-axis and the y-axis allow you to describe any two-dimensional shape. Okay, so that's what you print. And then the z-axis moves the bed up, from the, the x-axis up, uh, and that gives you the next layer. Okay. So you have to control it, which means that there's a kit of electronic parts, so there's soldering involved. So if you like soldering, there's not too much. This, these parts are for, that's for one of these the smaller boards. What those boards do are control a couple of motors, so you need two boards to control all the motors. Um, a lot of the, inst the instructions for doing that are online. And it's kept up to date so that what's online is correct for the version of the electronics you've got. Um, need to check what uh, equipment's available? For well, like how, many, how many people can be doing soldering? We have um, like 13 more doing soldering. Right, okay, enough. Yeah. Okay, so that's the board complete, that's the circuit diagram. So you, there's access to all the information, so you get circuit diagrams, a list of components and so on. Right. So this is basically when pe people who, who are hobbyists in electronics, this is the kind of thing they do. It's the same thing you do if you work in electronics as well. Um, so you need two of those. And then you need this one, which is the microcomputer. Uh, now, I chose to mount it on this panel for various reasons. Um, so when I finished soldering it, I mounted it all up. And then I had to wire it. So again, I had to figure out the wiring. That's the power supply, and that's the cat. So this is the website you go to for all the information about how the design works, how you wire up the electronics, and so on. Okay, it will become fairly clear when you get into the activity. Um, once you've done that, though, once you've built the machine and you've got it printing, and you've got it printing accurately, which is a bit of an adventure in itself, you can then improve it. So what this picture shows is at least four improvements I made to the basic design. You can even print a whole other printer. You can design another printer. There are, there are designs on the web that you can download for very different kinds of printers. Um, right, so that's. Any questions at this point? I think the idea is that everyone should get some experience in doing 
all the different parts of the construction. So you should all get some experience of doing some soldering, uh, construction, certainly the programming, okay? figuring out how you align it and how you maintain it. These machines need a bit of maintenance. Um, so it's as well to know how to do that. Um, right, when you actually use it, Okay. So this is the software running on the PC. I'll show it to you later. It's controlling the printer. Okay, you load you load the object to be printed into here, and then this controls the printer and how it prints it. You can't. It's not very clear, but the bits that it's printing at that point are in red, so you see what sort of progress it's making, and that's the overall progress bar of the window. And this is it printing. So you can see the kind of motion it's making. The, the bed's going in and out. This is going left and right. So you can do any two-dimensional kind of object. And it goes, prints it, and then it will change the layout. 